ya ali madad today we'll be talking about ginans the religious poetry of south asian ismailis who are also referred to as the ismailis of the peer sadadin tradition ginans originating from the religio cultural context of the indian subcontinent have been an important part of the religious lives of ismailis of south asian origin whether they are living in the indian subcontinent or living as a diaspora around the world sometimes ginans are viewed as less islamic than the arabic and persian muslim literature this view is expressed by those amongst whom we live but sometimes also by ismailis themselves let us look at how late professor aziz ahmed spoke about ginans aziz ahmed in his famous work an intellectual history of islam in india which was first published in 1969 presents an interesting observation while talking about the literary personality of the ismaili ginan literature he expressed that his this literature doesn't have what he called the islamic personality let us reflect on this quote discussing what is islamic or un-islamic and who decides something to be such is beyond the scope of this presentation however without dwelling deep into the debate i would like to say using michael gilsnan's words what leads one to this way of thinking or use this type of language according to him we are tempted to believe of it that is islam as a single unitary and all determining object a thing out there with a will of its own this way of looking at islam which is practiced by over 1.8 billion muslims living in almost all countries and making up almost one fourth of the world population results into labeling some muslim practices literature art etc as less islamic or un-islamic as mentioned earlier in today's talk we do not have the possibility of discussing what is islamic and what is not who can or cannot speak for islam or for that matter can one speak of islam as a single well defined entity that every muslim around the world agrees on however some of the discussion we'll have on ginanic vocabulary will provide you with a lens through which you can look at these questions in this talk we'll primarily try to situate ginans in their cultural context to achieve this objective i'll pick up some tropes that is literary motifs or symbols frequently used in ginans and compare them with those used in sufi and bhakti literature from south asia quite often when i speak to the jamaat about ginans i'm asked if there are ias publications that can help us further our knowledge about the subject so During this talk I'll introduce multiple IAS publications that the jamaat can access to know more on this topic. Before I give you some examples of the vocabulary used in Ginans let us talk about the language of poetry. As Ginans are written in poetic form as opposed to prose it is important for us to understand this aspect of the literature. I am reminded of Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah's 1931 interview that he gave to the daily sketch of london please don't go looking for this newspaper as in 1971 this newspaper was merged with the daily mail the quote that you see on your screen has been taken from the two volumes of imam sultan mohammad shah alaihi wasallam speeches that were edited annotated and introduced by kk aziz it was an ias project and the work was published by kegan paul in the interview imam sultan mohammad shah says poetry is the voice of god speaking through the lips of man if great painting puts you in touch with nature great poetry puts you in direct touch with god let us try to understand the difference between poetry and other kind of literature a bit more dr aziz smile in his work the poetics of religious experience another ias publication highlights that the poetic language especially poetry which speaks of being as a whole does not just present straightforward proposition of fact he writes unlike the language of information poetic language does not state facts he adds it shows a way of thinking and speaking in which metaphor symbol and analysis are the essence which challenge the imagination feeling and reason while reading ginans we need to understand that ginanic language which is a language of poetry uses metaphors symbols and imagination this language of poetry or in the context of today's talk this language of ginans 
is different from the language of a constitution or a legal language. Symbols and metaphors are used to express personal experiences and feelings. If we take them literally, we miss the point. When someone uses his or her finger to point at something, what matters is what is being pointed at and not if the person is using the left or the right hand finger or which finger the person is using. The one who focuses on the finger is missing the point. That is an object that requires one's attention. Dr. Ismail, in one of his other works titled A Scent of Sandalwood, states, the Ginans are a religious literature, not a compendium of religious beliefs, nor a manual of religious ceremonies. It is important to keep in mind that we don't go looking for something that Ginans are not meant to convey. Ginans are part of the religious literature of a large Jamaat originating from the subcontinent. It is a tradition that is being called our wonderful tradition. I am not suggesting Ginans are just like any other poetry. Of course, we Ismailis from South Asian tradition believe that Ginans are more than just any poetry. To use Dr. Ismail's words from the previous quote, they are a religious literature. Also, it is important to note that Ginans are attributed to Peers and Sayyids, who in most cases were in direct physical contact with the Imam of the time and were tasked with the responsibility to communicate Imam's messages to the Jamaat. We also believe that these individuals had achieved a higher spiritual level. What in Sufi tariqas is referred to as a maqam, they are believed to be at a higher maqam than those for whom Ginans serve as a source of inspiration, us. Let us move on and take some examples from Ginans. Many Ginans talk about Jannat, the paradisical garden. We all know a very famous Ginan, Eji Dunya Sirjine. The Ginan has a verse where the Jamaat is asking the Peer about the heaven. It reads, Eji Jumloji Puche Apna Jivna Pirne Amra Purina Gharche Keva the Jamaat or the assembled gathering is asking, what does the house of paradise look like? And the peer responds, Eji sonani etri ne rupana thambaji, sau kasturi kera gara, the house with bricks of gold and pillars of silver, where the floor is plastered with musk, that is kasturi. Let us look at another example. Imam Shah talks about sovan ite tena ghar chanaya, the house is built of gold bricks and kasturina gar, that floor is plastered with musk, kasturi. Of course, he also adds precious stones like diamonds and rubies. Once again, his verse talks about Jannat, which is similar to what P. Sadarin describes in his Ginan. More or less, the description matches with the Quranic idea of Jannat. Interestingly, the description then goes beyond this and talks about the Jannat where Huris are waiting for the ones who have performed good deeds during their time on earth. Well, you hear of Huris and Ghulams in the Quran. The difference is, Huris in Imam Shah's Ginans are waiting for the righteous ones with the betel leaves in their hands. Betel leaves, what we call Pan or Pan Ka Bida in many Indic languages. Let us look at some, some of the Quranic verses that talk of Jannat. As you can see from the numbers mentioned on the slide, there are many verses that describe Jannat, the garden in paradise, that the righteous are promised in the hereafter. I am sure those of you who have read the Quran know that though there are many verses in the Quran that talk about Jannah, there is none that talks about the pan, bitter leaf. It talks about rivers of water, milk of which the test never changes, rivers of wine, a joy to those who drink, and rivers of honey. It also talks about all kinds of fruits, the wine that will offer no afterache or suffering due to intoxication. However, no mention of pan kabira, that is betel leaves. Here is the verse from Jannat Puri for those who want to read it. It reads, pan na bida Tena hatma, jene daye pan mukhwas. 
I'm sure you're familiar with the vocabulary. The extent to which paradise is contextualized in terms of the milieu of the time can be understood from the fact that Huris in the description of Jannat are eagerly awaiting their groom with betel leaves in their hands. The imagery clearly borrowed from the local marriage tradition, the South Asian tradition. Ah, one may get tempted to say, this is what makes it un-Islamic. Before we get into this, let us answer a question. Are we, South Asian Nizari Ismailis, the only Muslims who struggled with the idea of Jannat? How did some other Muslims from this region understand Jannat? Asim Roy, while talking about Bengali Sufis and their murids, narrate a beautiful story. In the story, a Sufi master is narrating the event of Mairaz, the nighttime journey of seven heavens that we believe was awarded to our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and talks about the Prophet being served best of the dishes. And the writer goes on to describing these dishes. He claims the first dish that was served to the Prophet in the heaven was fish. Asim Roy comments on this. He writes, Muhammad was inclined to fish, but not just any part of it, its brain, its cerebral part. I'm sure many in the audience are aware that most Bengalis love moshli and ebhat, that is fish and rice. More importantly, the fish brain is seen as a delicacy. I guess Westerners would prefer caviar over the brain, but for a Bengali, that's what matters. And that's what the Jannat of this Sufi master is offering them. The Sufi is not interested in just the literal translation of the Quranic idea. But the attempt here is to translate the feeling and emotions, emotions that an Arab would experience while reading the description of the Quranic Jannat. Both the Sufi story and Ginans are trying to go beyond words and are focusing on what is evoked in those words. Can one say this way of speaking by a Sufi is less Islamic? To a person from the South Asian context who experiences fresh water, milk, honey, fruits, etc. in abundance, the Quranic Jannat becomes attractive when one speaks of Sonani, Eteri, Nerupana, Stham, gold bricks and silver pillars, and of course, bitter leaves. Let us take another example. Quite often, when we read Ginans, we come across the spiritual union being expressed using the symbols of a physical union between two individuals. Bridal symbolism is quite common in Ginans. Are the Ismailis of peace Sadadin tradition unique in using these symbols? Before I go to the Indic context, let me highlight that these symbols are used in both the Old and the New Testament. In Catholic Christianity, the human soul is presented as the bride of God. Here, I must acknowledge the work done by Professor Asani and Professor Tanvir Anjum. I have sourced some of my examples from their works. Metaphoric use of marriage with God has been a common theme in Sufi literature. The 9th century Persian Sufi Bayezid Bistami referred to Sufis as the brides of God. Another famous Sufi, well known to the West, Jalaluddin Rumi, also known as Maulana Rumi, uses the wedding metaphor in his well-known work Masnavi Manavi. He uses it to talk about the spiritual union of the soul with the beloved. I'm sure many of the audience members are familiar with the word Urs. The word Urs is used to refer to the death anniversary of a Sufi sheikh or a Sufi master and is derived from an Arabic word for wedding. Used in this context, it is alluding to the union of the Sufi with the beloved. Thus, the death of a Sufi master gets celebrated and called Urs, wedding. Coming closer to the home, such symbols are used by the poets of Bhakti tradition from South Asia. Mirabai, the 16th century poetess, portrays herself as the bride of Lord Krishna. Similarly, many male Vaishnavite poets compare themselves with gopis, that is, cowherd girls, and seek a spiritual reunion with their Lord. 
The expression is very similar to what Sayyida Imam Begum, a female Ginan writer from pre Sadadin tradition, talks when she says, Darshan Diyo Mora Nath. Nath, here meaning a husband. Similar to many Sufis, Hassan Kabirdin assumes a feminine role and says, Nari Thayne Venu, I beseech you as your woman, as your bride. Can one say that these Ginans are any less Islamic than Rumi's Masnavi or Bayezid Bistami's works? These symbols were common in the culture in which these individuals were operating. Let me give you an example from Sikh literature. Guru Nanak, who walked this earth in the late 15th, early 16th century, in his Shabad, in Guru Granth Sahib, talks about two categories of human soul, Duhagan and Suhagan. Duhagan refers to those whose love remain unfulfilled and Suhagans are those ones who enjoy union with their beloved. Do the words Suhagan and Duhagan sound familiar? We have heard them in Ginans, many Ginans. We all have heard the Ginan Jire Wala Satgur Sathe Gothri Kije. The peer says that he was a Duhagan, that is, he was unfulfilled. But the union with his Mola made him Suhagan. Duhagan Hati te Suhagan Kidi. Similar ideas can be found in famous Indian Sufi poet Amir Khusro's poetry. Amir Khusro, whose mausoleum is located in Nizamuddin Basti near Humayun tomb in Delhi. The Aga Khan Trust for Culture is doing some amazing work in and around this area. Let us look at a couple of examples from Amir Khusro's poetry. His very popular poem, which I'm sure most of you have heard, Chhap Tilak Sab Chini Mohse Naina Milaike, where he says, Mohe Suhagan Kinhi Mohse Naina Milaike. By looking at me, you made me Suhagan. Amir Khosro, in another poem, talks about his marriage with his master Nizamuddin, and his poetry specifies that such spiritual union between him and his master was witnessed by famous Sufis like Qutubuddin Kaki and Baba Farid. He says, Khusro is the bride and writes, Qut and Farid, those two famous Sufis, came in the wedding party. Amir Khusro, like many other Sufis from the Indian subcontinent, uses words like Pi, Pia, which literally mean beloved in Indic languages. There are many such words that are commonly shared by all Muslim and non-Muslim religious figures from South Asia. For example, Ishq, Didar, Darshan, etc. And we, we know many such words. When I talk about such symbols, I generally get asked, these are cultural symbols and maybe it is fine to use them. But Peirce spoke about avatars, that is incarnations. Well. That too is widely used symbol by Sufis. A Sufi named Shah Fazl Rahman, who died in 1895 and was a Naqshbandi Sufi. It is important to note that Sayyida Imam Begum is believed to have passed away in 1866. So we are talking about someone who is comparatively a recent figure in South Asian history, who lived after Sayyida Imam Begum. He lived in a town in the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. During his discourse with his murids, he used to translate the Quranic chapters, surahs. Whenever he translated the word Allah, he translated it as Ishwar and Parmeshwar. More interesting to note is that when he translated the Quranic terms Rasul and Nabi, he translated them as Avtar. It is important that we understand this process of decontextualizing something from one culture and recontextualizing it in a local context, local environment. In our case, peers were recontextualizing our faith to the Indic context. The attempt by Sufis and peers was towards minimizing foreignness of an idea. Hope the examples that we have used have helped the audience situate Ginans of a wonderful tradition in their South Asian context. The fact 
that the vocabulary used in Ginan is similar to those used by other Muslims from the region would hopefully allow us to reflect on how one can speak about Islamic and non-Islamic or un-Islamic. I also hope that session has got us better prepared to question, do Ginans really lack Islamic personality? Before I end my talk, let me quickly take you through the resources that we have used throughout the session and also some more resources that are available through your ITREB in your region. Of course, that if you decide to read further. The top four publications that you see on your slide are directly related to the topic of Ginans. All four of them, A Scent of Sandalwood by Dr. Aziz Ismail, Ecstasy and Enlightenment by Dr. Ali Asani, as well as the secondary curriculum modules on Muslim devotional and ethical literature, as well as faith and practice that you see on the screen, include Ginan translations. The one on literature also includes the translation of some verses from Shikwa and Jawab Shikwa, the famous works by Alama Iqbal, where Iqbal complains to Allah. Shikwa is the work where he complains to Allah. But a few years later, he writes another work, which is called Jawab Shikwa, response to his complaint. And some verses from this work are available in the literature module. While reading translations of prose and more so poetry, it is important to keep in mind that translating a poem from one language to another is a difficult, if not an impossible task. Translators are often faced with a difficult choice of picking one meaning of interpretation in a foreign language, while in the original language, the word may be used in multiple ways, in multiple contexts. The translator is presenting his or her interpretation. The one at the bottom by Dr. Aziz Ismail talks about this challenge. It's called the poetics of religious experience. The one by late Dominic Sheila Khan, not directly referred to in today's presentation called Crossing the Threshold, helps us understand the context in which Ginans evolved. The volume edited by Dr. Farhad Daftari called A Modern History of Ismailis has an article by Dr. Ali Asani that talks about Satpant or what we call Pir Sadar in tradition. For those who want to know more about this tradition, during the session, we have also used Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah's speeches, a very useful resource for those who are interested in history of this period. And if they want to know more about how the previous Imam contributed at the national and international levels. Hope my talk has provided you enough reasons to pick up some of these works and have a look at them. I do hope that you will find some of these readings as inspirational and as educating as I found them. I thank you for your time and attention and I hope you enjoyed this talk. Ya Ali Madad.